Good morning, or good afternoon, or whatever time of day it is for you all. Regardless of the time, it's great to see your smiling faces. I'm super excited to get into the material with you today. All right, in this short video, we're gonna be talking about self-assessment. First, we'll dive into some questions of how do we assess our own personality. I'll ask you some questions, have a pen or pencil ready to write down some responses. And then we'll look at the actual definitions of self-assessment as well as personality. We'll take a little bit of a deep dive into what personality is and how has, it, how has our understanding of it evolved over the years. And then in the next video, we'll take a look at one of the most common personality assessments, the big five personality test. All right, so why? Why should we be self-reflective? Why should we assess our personalities? And why is it important to you as you graduate and leave college and enter the real world and start your career? Okay, so if you have that pen or pencil handy, go ahead and take a minute and answer the following question. Who are you? Who are you? I mean, you have a name, you have a job description maybe, or perhaps your description is a student, that's your occupation, you're a brother, a sister, but who are you? Don't mind me, I'll just stare right into the camera as you write down who you are. Okay, I'm just kidding, that was creepy. Okay, if you've written that down, then good job. Some of your answers might include some of the following. Okay, your name, maybe your job title, okay? Maybe that's a student, maybe that's a full-time student and part-time nanny, maybe it's a full-time student and full-time caretaker of a family member, maybe it's a student and an athlete, you're a student athlete, perhaps you have already started your career, okay? Or maybe you are, maybe you're working as a barista, any of those is okay, but, but that's just one aspect of your personality. Maybe it's your role in your family, all right? Maybe you are an older brother or a younger sister or the oldest of seven and you're taking care of most of them because your parents are working super hard to put you guys through college. Um, or maybe you don't have much in the way of close family relationships. Maybe you define yourself by your hobbies and your passions, okay? Maybe you're a surfer or or an athlete, or a musician, or a, um, an artsy creative type, okay? So any of these things could go into the definition of who you are. Maybe your place of residence, okay? Are you an American? Are you a Californian? Are you a global citizen, all right? All of these things could be part of, but really just a small part of who you are. Maybe more comprehensive would be a description of your beliefs and values. What do you stake your life upon? What types of values do you make decisions by? How, what principles guide your life? Uh, maybe your genetic code, right? Maybe your physiology is really who you are. And if we boiled it down uh, and looked at your DNA, maybe that would tell us a lot about you. But maybe your personality, okay? Because I know a lot of us aren't gonna go get a DNA test and try to sequence all of our genes and, and figure out our, our, who we are based on that, but we can measure our personality. Because our friends and our family members, they get a bit of a taste of our personality, okay? We interact with them and they experience who we are. Our future employers and those people who we serve and work under and above and who we lead and who we follow, those people will get to know our personalities. Okay, so maybe, maybe who you are is at least in part, and maybe a big part, um, the personality that you give off to everyone around you. Now let me ask you this, as you are finishing up your college degree uh, and you're entering a career path, whether that's as a graduate student or at an entry level job in the vocation of your calling, as you're launching into that, you will be a leader. Whether or not you're starting the lowest on the, the whether or not you're starting at the lowest rung on that totem pole, you will be a leader who is looked at as somebody who has been privileged to go to a private Christian um, 
liberal arts college who has had the privilege of having professors as mentors um, who have poured into you and have provided for you these learning experiences. And believe it or not, you're gonna be a couple steps ahead of some of your peers. So let's take another minute and write down some leadership qualities that you possess currently. Starting a minute now. Okay, while you do that, I'm gonna go get a drink of water. Okay, I'm back, and hopefully you've written down some of those qualities of leadership that you possess. Okay, hold on to these descriptions, your description of yourself, who you are, and what qualities make you a good, a good leader, and we will use those in some of our reflections this semester. Now, some answers could include the following list from Forbes, okay? So these are the things that they say make a good leader. Oh, there they all are. Okay, enthusiasm, integrity, communication skills, loyalty, decisiveness, managerial competence, empowerment, and charisma. Okay, I don't know about you, but some of these things are a little bit hard for me to, to define. Like, what is charisma? That seems to me to be a combination of some things. Maybe enthusiasm, good communication skills, and decisiveness, right? And maybe competence. All right, those things mixed together to me blend into charisma. But these, this is just a small sample of some of what could make a good leader. But the great thing is, is that everybody's unique makeup allows them to lead in substantially different ways, okay? And so you don't have to look like the next leader, right? The person next to you or the, the person who you, you were used to seeing in charge, your leadership style might be different. But we don't know yet how to leverage your personality traits until we've reflected on that personality and until we can actually assess it to see where are your strengths, where are your, where are your weaknesses, and how do you lead out of them. So we know that leadership is important, right? And we know that it's comprised of many different unique factors that can be different from person to person depending on personality. Now, throughout history, many of our greatest thinkers have keyed in on this fact that in order to fully leverage your individual talents and gifts, you first have to start not with knowing more about the outside world, but with knowing more about yourself and being self-reflective and turning inside, being introspective and really assessing what you have to work with as well as those factors that you really need to improve upon. So we're gonna go through just a few quotes from some ancient thinkers from the past as well as some modern ones, uh, just to give you an idea of the importance of self-reflection and assessment. Okay, so this first one, knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength, but mastering yourself is true power. I love this quote, this is amazing. Think for a minute to see if you know who said this. Okay, you can tell a little bit by the background of the picture. It was Lao Tzu, who is an ancient Chinese philosopher. Um, I forget which dynasty, it's in my notes, but <laughs> uh, maybe I'll put it in the description to the video. Uh, he was one of the founders of some of the ancient Chinese religions. Okay, moving on to the next one. To know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, and again, key in on the background. Who said this? Probably someone Greek. It was Socrates, okay, in 400 BC. Here's another. Know God, know yourself, and know your calling. Who said this one? Ta-da, it was me. I knew that. Um, I definitely shouldn't be put in the same category as those other people, but really that's what I want to communicate to all of you in this class. Okay, what we're trying to do, we're trying to know ourselves better. We're trying to know God better. And through both of those conduits, we will receive our calling from God. Okay, because a calling, we'll find out in 
um, Every Good Endeavor, the book by Tim Keller that we'll all read this semester, we'll find out that a calling comes from somebody greater than yourself, something outside of yourself. But to really discern it and to hear it and to understand how it applies to you specifically, you have to both know the speaker, right? Know the, the source of that calling, which would be God. And you also have to know yourself very well. And so that's why we spend so much time reflecting in this class. Now, personality 101, this is going to be a brief overview of personality. Here's two definitions. The first is personality is the coherent pattern of affect, cognition, and desires as they lead to behavior. All right, so those three things, affect is kind of like your, uh, kind of like your outward facing emotions, how you seem on the outside, your mood, the vibes that you're sending. Uh, cognition, which would be your thought processes. And then those goals, those driving desires that are motivating you, your motives. And then all three of those sort of combine into your behavior, and that would be personality. Now, another, another one put out by the APA, uh, personality is individual differences in characteristic patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Okay, so there we see the same three, uh, but maybe in, in more lay terms. So thinking, feeling, and behaving instead of affect, cognition, and desires. Uh, but essentially, this is, this is an all-encompassing um, description of, of who you are as far as how you interact with people in the world around you. So how, how, what do we know about personality and uh, what can science tell us about these traits and are they measurable, etc.? So some of the earliest personality research came from ancient Greece. Hippocrates, uh, he posited that there were four humors. Okay, humors are like these, um, I don't know, ethereal substances in the body. I'm not really, I'm really sure. So he posited that there were these four humors, uh, such as hot versus cold, moist versus dry, who hates the word moist? Moist, I'll say it again. <laughs> I kind of like that word, moist. Anyways, it, it really rolls off the tongue. These four humors, okay? And they were opposites of each other. And so you could describe personalities based on that. Fast forward to Plato, and he suggested a classification of four types of factors, okay? Artistic, sensible, intuitive, and reasoning. And these four factors, any blend of these four would make up any individual personality. Going forward, Aristotle was the first to connect, to make that connection between the personality and the physical body, which I think is just incredible. Uh, before he had all of the answers that science is giving us today, to make this assertion I think was just, I mean, it's light years ahead of his time. And as kinesiologists, people who study kinesiology and who are going into the medical field or into the movement science field or sports science field, I think this is just so cool to see the root of our discipline rooted in what Aristotle said here. Now, moving forward into more, uh, slightly more modern times, there was the study of phrenology. Okay, so this uh, predated psychology and it was, kind of, it was really just pseudoscience. It was basically measuring direct relationships between physical characteristics and psychological or personality characteristics, meaning uh, they would measure various parts of your brain or your skull and, and basically then make conclusions about your personality and behaviors based on that, which we know now is, is uh, pseudoscience. It wasn't until the case of Phineas Gage that a direct link between the brain and the personality was established. Okay, so Phineas Gage was a railroad worker and there was some sort of a uh, mishap with some explosives and it shot a huge gate, uh, you know, gauge of steel rod up through his skull. You can see in the picture here that his eyes closed and that's because it basically entered, I think, below his jaw and went straight up through his head and he lived, okay? He walked to the doctor and, you know, was operated upon, but he completely changed in personality after that because this uh, piece of metal that entered his head, it it altered his brain. So he could not keep his appointments. He showed little respect or compassion for others. He uttered the grossest profanity, right? So this guy went from a really kind-hearted, you know, family man to just this rough rogue of a guy who just couldn't make it in society, okay? And it, it just really changed his personality. Now moving on into the late 1800s and early 1900s, we have Sigmund Freud, who is an Australian, who is an Austrian neurologist. And he has a ton of contributions to the field of psychology. 
However, many of them have now been debunked, but he still has a lot of, of key contributions to psychology and to the theories of personality. So he posited the id, which is your primal or instinct or your survival mechanisms, then the ego, which is a bridge between the subconscious and the conscious, and your superego, which are your higher qualities in your moral framework. And so he said that all of us have these three different levels and we're operating with all three of them at any given time, but sometimes one is sort of leading the other two or overpowering the other two. And his important assertion was that unconscious behaviors and motivations often would then express themselves in our outward behaviors and we wouldn't realize it. And then we have Carl Jung who is really, I would say, the father of personality. And of course, I'm not a psychologist again, but this is just, this is just a, a brief overview. He was a Swiss psychiatrist and he's the one who came up with the introversion, extroversion spectrum. And he theorized four psychological functions thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. And we're going to see that actually a lot of personality tests are based on his, his paradigms of thinking about personality and are really use, they really use his work as a foundation to build off of. And then finally, we have Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This hierarchy of needs essentially says that our basest needs are physiological. And we cannot progress into the next level of desires or motivations until we've met our physiological needs. Okay, so it goes physiological, then it goes safety. Okay, so if we, if we are breathing, we have food and water, sleep, homeostasis, etc., uh, and we've met those needs, then our next needs are safety. Okay, this is um, security, security of employment, of body, of resources, of health, family, property. Once we've met those, then we progress to seeking love and belonging, okay? Friendship, family, sexual intimacy. And from there, it's esteem. You know, how, how do our peers think of us? How, what's our confidence level? What, what achievements are we getting? And then finally, the top level is self-actualization. This is uh, morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem solving. And we can't get there until we've gone through those other stages. And so essentially what this, um, what this theory is saying is that Hey, if you have all of this, but then suddenly your uh, physiological well-being is taken away, let's say you suddenly lose access to water, you're not going to be seeking self-actualization. You're not going to be seeking the esteem of others. You're not going to be uh, looking for you know, love or belonging. You're just going to be looking for water. Okay, It takes you all the way back down. And this is another fundamental personality theory. Okay. So we're at the end of this intro to self-assessment. Okay, we've, we've looked at uh, some questions of who are you, what makes you a good leader. We've looked at some quotes from some ancient philosophers and early personality theorists. We have looked at some of the research leading to personality assessments and self-assessments like we are going to take in this class. The next video in this self-assessment series will be about the OCEAN or the five factors personality test. OCEAN stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Five factors that make up your personality. So go ahead and click over to the next video, which should be appearing somewhere on the screen. Thank you guys for following along with me with this brief overview of self-assessment. I hope you will stay tuned and continue reflecting on who you are and who God has called you to be. I'll see you guys next time. Whoa, you're pushing it overhead, you're doing presses? Oh, nice, buddy. Getting jacked. Get it? Because that's what you mean.